International Education Week. 15 Millennium Global Challenges, yes. Um, Mario, are you going first? Yes, sir. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, today's presentation is over democrati democratizing and drifting from democracy. The presenters are Dr. Roman Krestov, Dr. Nathan Mitchell, and Amore Times. So the first question is, what is democracy? And is you, the US a democracy? So um, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the, a democracy is a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation, usually involving periodically held free elections. So um, in defining a democracy, there's two different models we look at. The process model of democracy, which essentially ensures that there's a process where citizens can engage in civic affairs, such as elections. So democracy's um, a key tenet is ensuring free and fair elections and frequent elections. So free elections are where most people should be able to participate fully in the election. Universal suffrage is present. And then fair elections is where the outcome of the election is uncertain. So um, and that barriers of participation are limited. So if we look back to pre-Voting Rights Act, um, like grandfather clause, poll taxes, things like that were barriers to participation. And then fraud and corruption are limited as well. And frequent elections are elections um, and political turnover happen frequently. So you're not electing people every 30 years. We have elections every four years. And then the quality of life model um, it, for democracy is when democracies protect property rights, minority rights, and inspire a higher quality of living than other systems. And we're about to discuss some of those other systems. Uh, regime type is basically how a nation governs itself. And so um, every, every country has its own type of government. Uh, parliamentary systems are more centered in the legislature, and so the chief executive is a, a selected from that legislature. What's cool about this is that it's a very efficient way of running government, that uh, the power is centralized in one branch, and the majority party or majority coalition is able to get things very, done very quickly. And presidential systems like the United States or Brazil or Russia or France well, uh, presidential systems have the uh, separation of powers. So you basically have uh, the, the branches have to negotiate. Typically policy is more deliberative here. Um, it should be better so that uh, you know, the more debate, more stakeholders, uh, things happen much slower. Um, Semi-presidential systems have a combination kind of like what Russia does where the, you have a prime minister that kind of runs the legislature, then you have a president with significant powers. Um, authoritarian systems, this is where you have one individual or one group of individuals that kind of run uh, the nation. For example, North Korea would be considered an authoritarian government where uh, the, the Kim family is supported by the military and then they're able to uh, you know, kind of dictate what happens in the, the, the nation. Uh, this is a relatively new way of thinking about a regime type. It's something called an anocracy. This is a uh, something that looks democratic, but maybe isn't as democratic as we would like it to be. Russia might actually be considered a anocracy. Um, Russia has some elements of democratic practice where the president is elected, the legislature is elected, and some other branches of government are elected but they don't really have a free media. And also an interesting thing about it is that the president of Russia gets to determine which candidates run against him. So uh, even though it's democratic, you know, just a little bit, um, the people don't have as much say. Is it me? I guess this is me. Okay. Um, 
there are five regime types that kind of feed into what we were talking about earlier. Um, there's a lot of question is, is democracy the best form of government? Um, Churchill said uh, in 47 that democracy is the worst form of government except for all others. So when we're looking at the types of uh, benefits that you get out of democracy, you know, uh, it may be better that you are more authoritarian if you're looking for different economic outcomes, um, that, you know, things can happen much more quickly, the government can respond to crises quicker and things of that nature. What's better about democratic systems, as Amari kind of mentioned, is that they typically have higher forms of uh, uh, human development because people are able to participate, the markets are freer and things of that nature. So you have some other types of uh, systems that we talk about. An aristocracy is ruled by the elite. So that would be kind of be like a monarchy um, where the uh, people that used to own all the land kind of run the government. Um, a uh, oligarchy is where basically the uh, uh, corporations kind of run. So you have groups of people that run large sections of the government. And then you can kind of see uh, the tyranny, which kind of feeds into the, uh, the, the authoritarian governments that we talked about before. Um, so one way we measure democracy is you, you have three, there's several ways of looking at it. You have a Freedom House, Polity and Human Development Index. Um, Freedom House is an international organization that you can check out, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll post that in the chat, that will uh, looks at the democratic institutions across the, the, the globe. And then they rate countries based on how free those, or those institutions are. So uh, they look at the number of the people that are involved in press. Um, they look at the freedoms for journalists. They look at uh, the types of civil liberties that are available. They look at whether or not you have a state-run media and things of that nature. Uh, polity is another score that's very similar that looks at the you know, electoral institutions or the political institutions and how democratic they are. It ranges from basically uh, negative 10 to positive 10. Positive 10 is more democratic, negative 10 is more authoritarian. And then the Human uh, Development Index looks at um, how likely are people to reach their full potential in the country? So um, is there enough industry? Is there enough um, education? Is, are there you know, different rights and things that would help somebody be able to reach uh, their full economic potential? Um, but you know, there's not just a demo de democracy versus undemocratic system. There's a wide variety of what we're talking about here. And, you know, sometimes countries move from being more democratic to, least demo to lesser democratic uh, based on crises and things of that nature. Uh, and part of this presentation is looking at that. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit more in, in depth about the different measures of democracy. Uh, so just like Nathan mentioned, Freedom House is one of those measures and he actually looks at two main components of democracy and freedom generally. Uh, one of them is called political rights and the other one is civil liberties. How much uh, of the opponents or of the opposition in a country has the opportunity to engage in politics? And also, are people guaranteed some sort of civil liberties the way we have our Bill of Rights, so to speak, where the government cannot infringe on um, people's rights and liberties. So these are the main components that get rated and the maximum score according to Freedom House is 100. Some countries get very, very close to 100. Of course, there's no perfect regime and they change uh, yearly, but you can see even the United States, which we, um, claim to be the center or the cradle of, the, of modern democracy doesn't achieve a really high score. Uh, we only get 86 for this year, kind of varies up and down. But Australia is rated uh, usually quite, quite higher than the United States. And if you've been following the events of the last uh, six to eight months since the lockdown, Australia has had a pretty draconian measures in terms of the lockdown. They're only second to China. China uh, 
uh, locked down their country very extensively. Uh, Australia was second to them. Uh, people had been arrested for going um, farther than five miles from their uh, dwelling and so on. So you see Australia still gets pretty high uh, rating simply because their political rights and liberty, civil liberties tend to score quite higher than most countries. And of course, if you go to East European um, countries, they will be a little lower. If you go to Northwest European countries, they'll be a little higher. So this is the Freedom House as a measure of uh, freedoms. So the next slide would show how we can use uh, other countries, for example, Russia and South Sudan, even though theoretically the Freedom House is supposed to measure from zero to 100 and no country is supposed to be negatively uh, free. It, it seems kind of, kind of, kind of logical to, to think that a country can be rated negatively, but they can. So uh, South Sudan, simply because of their poor political rights uh, performance, gets really a poor score on that. And Russia, uh, Nathan mentioned that it is uh, not necessarily democratic country in the way we, we think of it. Uh, they have uh, some civil liberties, so you don't feel probably as oppressed as in some other countries, uh, yet the political rights there in terms of competition and creating a party and actually being a real opposition to the, to the ruling uh, elite or regime is quite problematic and they regularly get suppressed from showing any political initiative. So that's the Freedom House. Another um, issue, another measure of um, technically simply uh, the level of democracy is the polity uh, score that gets assigned to most countries, not all countries get rated, but that's strictly on how democratic they are. And in terms of democracy, uh, many components play a part, uh, but you can see from that picture that uh, most countries do get a rating on the level of democracy. And the United States, even though in the Freedom House, we were rated not the highest core in terms of democracy, we're considered a full democracy. And you can see from the ratings that democracy can be uh, lower scores and it can be actually autocracy. And some countries like China, Saudi Arabia and so on are rated as autocracy. In, in the Western hemisphere, Cuba seems to be the only autocracy that exists. So. And finally, the last measure uh, I'm going to discuss here is the Human Development Index, which technically is not a measure of democracy or of freedom. It's more of a measure to assess the development of a country, not just its economy, but as a people, how long and healthy life people live what is their level of education and their standard of living. So if we want really an objective measure or somewhat objective measure of how well a country is doing, we need to assess the way people are doing in that country. And the Human Development Index is a pretty good measure that uh, reflects exactly that idea. Uh, in that picture, you can see I've mentioned here, note Libya pre-2011. If you look at the African continent, Libya is the top central country that it's kind of a, a little bit of a darker green. So it's the dark, technically Libya at the time, 10 years ago had the highest uh, HDI that's before our involvement in that country. So they're doing quite well, of course it was, uh, the prosperity of the country was financed uh, simply by um, natural resources, but they had a pretty well established uh, regime, even though it wasn't exactly at the level of Western countries, they were doing quite well and outperforming uh, most uh, countries in the region, even South Africa, which is quite developed country. 
and uh, I'm gonna switch to the next performer now. There's a, some questions about how does a country democratize? So um, economic development is seen uh, as one of the biggest indicators of how the uh, democracies develop. Um, there's a lot of theory around the development of a middle class and where this, this group of individuals goes to. So if the middle class allies with, say, the working class or the serfs, uh, you tend to have more, eco uh, more dem democratic development. If the middle class allies with the elites, it tends to be a little bit more uh, authoritarian. Um, one of the ways that the countries democratize is through this process called modernization. So if you apply Maslow's hierarchy, that if you take care of, you know, the, the basic needs of security and uh, food, water, health care, you know, basic health care types of things. And then uh, if you apply this to a nation, if the nation provides or a government provides these basic services, then the people have more opportunities to start working on important things like uh, environmentalism, civil liberties, civil rights, voting, uh, increasing the franchise, minority rights. Um, so we're, we're getting up to this higher level of self-actualization. We call this post-materialistic values. So as long as you can take care of the basic needs of a country, thus through economic development, you start to see more and more opportunities for the people to demand rights and things that contribute to that quality of life. Um, culture matters. Um, so uh, the culture has to be open to having pluralism, where you have competition, you have different groups competing for scarce resources, um, and not necessarily closed or completely collectivist. Social capital is a, another way to kind of cons consider this. This is where people are, like again, the pluralism, where people are openly competing. You have groups, you have the ability to um, organize, you have the ability to uh, participate in full civil society and things of that nature. So uh, nations that have very low social capital, where people are not able to contribute as much to the country or they don't have as many uh, organizations to get involved in are less likely to be democratic. Um, one other thing that we've noticed is that oftentimes civil society is used by the governments to uh, quote unquote capture areas of the, the nation. So um, you may have lots and lots of organizations and groups for people to join, but they're state run. So um, the, the more democratic countries have it so that you have free reign, you have lots of different ideas competing, you know, the best ideas win, uh, and they're not necessarily controlled by the government. Uh, but theory basically says the more advanced the country is in terms of economically, you're more likely to see some democracy. So there is some talk about as China uh, becomes more developed in certain areas, you should see some more democratic types of institutions. Uh, but you do see in China right now that there is a high, what we call Gini index, or well, basically inequality is high from the rural areas and the urban. Okay, so during the 90s, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's this uh, idea that was developed by Samuel Huntington, uh, the democracy came in waves, and he described it by simply uh, putting at a chart or this figure that you would see on the bottom, I think it's a good representation because on that he would put the number of democracies in the world. So in the early 20th century, they reached this number of 33, which was a peak at the time. But then uh, after, uh, after that, uh, the democracy started collapsing and you would see it reached a trough at a number of 11. That was only 11 democracies in the whole world. That was at the beginning of World War II. And then after that, after World War II was uh, successful, the number of democracy increased and this kind of pattern kept uh, uh, repeating itself to a point where democracies developed a whole lot more. But the idea was that they come and go and uh, 
it's important to capture the moment, sort of like surfing, you, you kind of ride the wave and create as many democracies as possible because the idea is that democracies don't fight each other and the more democracies we have in the world, we'll be able to achieve peace. And this was a, an idea that was promoted that uh, if we achieve democracy throughout the world, it'll uh, bring human prosperity, it'll uh, decrease the level of clashes. Uh, you've heard the term clash of civilizations. It was also uh, coined by Samuel Huntington and the idea was that if you want to achieve global peace and prosperity, well, we should aim for democracy and economic development. So, okay. Uh, so the same uh, types of things that were described in the previous slide, um, the first wave of democracy is where you started to see uh, empires break up and you started to see more and more uh, individual countries uh, offer su suffrage. So even in our own country, you started to see um, more voting pass on from those who were you know, white male landowners to women, Native Americans, and things of that nature. <clears throat> Same thing happened in a lot of other countries. Um, the second wave of democracy was after World War II um, ended and a lot of countries, uh, you, you have started to adopt democratic systems uh, as a response to, um, you know, some what the United States was doing in Europe. You know, they were, you know, promoting democracy through uh, redevelopment uh, after the, the World War, and that was actually one of our uh, biggest agendas was promoting, you know, not necessarily American style democracy but democratic institutions. And then the third wave was uh, Latin America. Uh, where you started to see in East Asia and Eastern Europe, um, specifically after the uh, Soviet Union fell, um, you started to see more and more democrat democratic uh, institutions pop up. Um, in 2011, uh, you started to see what we call the Arab Spring. More Arab countries started to adopt, well, people started to demand that uh, their countries change and start to adopt more democratic systems. So. You saw protests all over the Middle East. You started to see um, it started in Tunisia where uh, somebody set themselves on fire as part of a protest. And so um, why this matters is in many of these Arab countries, you know, the economies were bad, particularly for young people. You would go to school and then you'd graduate and you wouldn't be able to get a job for 10 or 20 years. And this is real. And so uh, you know, they, they started to protest and ask for more, uh, more rights and uh, a better control of their futures. Um, yeah, so just to add on to that, the Arab Spring, it was multiple Middle Eastern and North African countries that were protesting. And the results of the Arab Spring um, really varied. So in countries like Tunisia, where the movement started, we had some positive results where the government um, changed their constitution. They added more um, liberal laws that just allowed better like healthcare, access to education, access to jobs. So we saw really great improvements, but then other countries remained in civil unrest. So we look at like Syria, which has been in like a years long civil war in Yemen that's facing the world's largest humanitarian crisis. And so it's really important to um, understand, I guess, or to look at why these countries remained in civil unrest. And perhaps if they had adopted that push for democracy, um, they wouldn't be in some of the predicaments um, that they're in now. And so the reason why there's this push for democracy is because some of the regimes that these Arab countries um, allowed or had didn't enable, like Dr. Mitchell was saying, like access to jobs. There was complaints of police brutality, governmental corruption, um, lack of access to healthcare, education, et cetera. All of these issues um, that the regimes didn't provide the quality of life for that perhaps democracy would provide that quality of life. And so that's why there was such a push for democracy in these countries. One of the ways that we can promote democracy is through uh, our I don't know, soft power. Uh, we talk a lot about hard power and soft power. 
Uh, soft power is how our culture and economy can spread throughout the world. Um, so some of the ways that we can promote democracy is through our e e economy. We've, uh, this past year, we've seen a lot of uh, engagement with uh, China over human rights issues, you know, that we're using our pocketbook to try to get them to make some changes. You can uh, have diplomatic institutions like Fulbright. The Fulbright program was created so that we can send American scholars abroad and bring international scholars here to have cultural and um, educational exchanges. And then through our uh, Hollywood. So uh, movies and uh, TV shows, a lot of that is exported to other countries and that does sort of take, you know, uh, our democratic institutions abroad. But we're also seeing some of that come here because a lot of movies are now being made in China and Bollywood. So we're having some cultural exchange that way. Hard methods of, of democracy promotion would be things like the military, where we would go in to uh, quote, quote, solve a problem um, or intervene into other governments. Uh, you had, um, uh, you know, Libya is a good example there where, you know, we, we fostered regime change. We also fostered regime change in Afghanistan and Iraq to different levels of success. Okay. Um, so uh, these are examples of uh, military interventions. Of course, the United States has been involved a lot more than these that are mentioned, but those are some of the most popular ones. Just like Nathan mentioned, uh, one way to do it is a soft way through the diplomacy, maybe sanctions uh, on the economy of another country. But if that doesn't work, or if it's not as productive as we would hope, the military intervention is left usually as the last uh, choice. Uh, Vietnam, everybody's heard of that war. Nicaragua, El Salvador are in the in Latin America, and we encouraged either one or the other side that was fighting the uh, communists. So we would um, try to prevent this domino effect of having communism spread all over the world. Iraq and Afghanistan are the most recent uh, U.S. involvements. So the wars have lasted roughly about close to 20 years. And I already mentioned Libya uh, before 2011, before, before Gaddafi would, was deposed. So those are the types of regime changes in democracy promotion that um, we have engaged in. Um, to try to end it up, because I know we're running out of time, uh, uh, 68 countries have suffered a, some level of decline in political and civil rights or civil liberties. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, economic downturn, but also um, crises in many of these countries. As countries have experienced crises and their governments will start to crack down. Um, some examples, you had uh, attacks on journalists. Many countries faced uh, downgrades in their democratic scores because they censored journalists or quote unquote disappeared them. Disappeared means a term from either anything from uh, execution, sending them to another country, jailing them, or anything type of that nature. This year, 23 journalists have been uh, disappeared, but there's been about a thousand journalists worldwide that have uh, either been jailed or we just don't know what happened to them. There's been a lot of ethnic conflict, particularly in India and China. Um, China has been um, instituting some uh, ethnic conflict with the Uyghurs. India has uh, basically had some issues in, um, uh, what's it called, Roman? The northern, the one that they always, Kashmir. Um, that uh, that whole area is now uh, not democratic at all. And India is the world's largest democracy over usually. Um, we're losing some respect for democratic norms. We've even seen this in the United States where you've seen the, the president walk out on national TV and clear out a group of peaceful protesters for a, um, a, a photo op. And then you can see um, other countries like uh, Saudi Arabia uh, you know, attacking dissidents in other countries, for example, Jamal Khashoggi. So um, even though we've made a lot of progress in, uh, in fostering dem democracy worldwide, we've seen some decline. And um, Roman, you want to take us out? 
yeah so these are the uh, sources that we've used i've posted some of those links on the chat in here so feel free to help yourself uh, thank you for attending this presentation it was uh, our pleasure to present uh, wish you best of luck i know some of you may have questions do you have anything quickly before i know you have to go yeah, i don't have any questions just but just comment just want to say that this was a wonderful presentation it was very informative i learned a lot so much so thank you so much for your time thank you for coming all right well and thank you to everyone who attended i think mrs myers is trying to speak but you're on mute mrs myers i would, I would just agree with you shadana it was a wonderful presentation we learned a lot and we thank you all for taking your time especially you students we know you're getting ready for your finals so we thank you so very much and hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions that we have coming up. So thank you very much. Appreciate you. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, I can't. I guess I can cut it off.